Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. It's the 19th of October, and uh, we have two two or three big events coming up. Uh, essentially, the main themes of our broadcast today are, are the following two. First of all, you must get a copy of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America, Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion from Progressive Press of California. You need to go to ProgressivePress.com, ProgressivePress.com. You can reach it through my website. Go to Tarpley.net and click on the cover of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America, Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion. People have often asked me, how can you support my work? You uh, like my work. You think it's valuable. Now's the time to show it. Buy that book. And uh, because of the uh, wonders of e-books, you could get a copy of the book for as little as $6. Now, I think that's, uh, that's a trivial amount for just about anybody. Uh, if you really support this broadcast, if you want to do something to facilitate what I do, to add some authority and some, uh, some uh, mass impact to the work of uh, putting this out under circumstances that were not that easy, go and buy the book. <laughs> buy more than one. <laughs> buy some for holiday giving, all kinds of holidays coming up, right? Get one to give to somebody at Thanksgiving, the uh, year-end Giving season is uh, is upon us very soon. Christmas is coming, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, all the rest, right? Any excuse to buy just too weird Bishop Romney and the Mormon takeover of America. So support me. Support me by buying that book. Uh, I need your help. Go out and do it now, or sit down and do it now. Uh, apropos of the book and the general theme of Romney, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, we can now announce on Halloween, Halloween night, October 31st, you can come to the National Press Club. That's on uh, 14th Street down by the Department of Commerce uh, in, in downtown D.C. It's not far from the U.S. Treasury. It's not far from the White House. It's the National Press Club. You can find it pretty easily. Uh, in the McClendon Room which is a little bit hard to find. It's sort of behind the kitchen in a certain way, but uh, it's the McClendon Room, and there we have meeting the McClendon Group, and this is a group that uh, for many years has had uh, seminars on uh, Wednesday nights generally. I am invited to the McClendon Group in the McClendon Room of the National Press Club on Halloween night on uh, uh, October 31st. If you want to come and get dinner, you come at 6 30 p.m. If you just want to come for the speech, come an hour later, come about 7.30. And it will be a summary of these uh, questions, uh, the, que the same material that is presented, or much some of the same, a sampling of the material, which is presented in the Just Too Weird Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America. So that's Halloween night, October 31st. Halloween at the Press Club. Halloween, uh, the Kolob. Kolob comes to the Press Club for Halloween. So uh, that's something I think that some people around here may be interested in. If people want to know, is there a ch are there um, you know, public discussions of this book? Well, I'm sure the book will come up uh, in this. Uh, they, they, strictly speaking, the title is uh, Mitt Romney's Mormon Background. For various reasons, that's the uh, the title of this appearance. I uh, urge you to come if you're in the Washington D.C. area. And then, of course, uh, even uh, sooner, on October 27th, which it turns out this is the anniversary of the last Saturday of the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 27th in New York City. That's going to be the. Uh, the uh, meeting that we've been talking about organizing for for quite a while, it's the meeting of the United Front Against Austerity. 
October 27th, a week from tomorrow. So by the time you hear this broadcast, that will be uh, ongoing. Uh, it'll be the following Saturday. So October 27th, from noon to 6, at the INN World Report Auditorium, 56 Walker Street, in Tribeca, near Canal Street, and uh, go to the uh, the website of that, right? Go to the website of the United Front Against Austerity. You don't know where that is? You can reach it through my website. Go to tarpley.net. Everybody knows tarpley.net. Click at the UFAA, United Front Against Austerity, logo on the top, and that will take you directly to that um, the full details on that event, right? A small contribution will be uh, requested. Uh, nobody will be turned away. Uh, if you're unemployed or a student or something, uh, do do come along and, and uh, there's there's room for uh, for everybody at that rate. This is about mass organizing. This is about mass organizing based on life and death economic issues. Other questions, however meritorious, have got to be um, subordinated to that. So those are the two big things. Uh, the the book. Just too weird. Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America. Get it from Progressive Press. Buy a paper copy, by all means. But if you can't afford a paper copy, $6 for an electronic copy. I think that's within the reach of just about everybody listening to this program. And the other question, then, is the October 27th uh, event in New York City, the United Front Against Fascism. And remember, if you're in the Washington area... There's also the Halloween, Halloween at the Press Club, Kolob at the Press Club, uh, 6.30 if you want dinner, uh, which there is a fee for, of course, and then uh, <coughs> 7.30 to hear the, uh, the presentation and the discussion. That's the McClendon Group. It's in the McClendon Room. Ask them for the McClendon Room when you get there. It's one of the harder rooms of the many rooms of the Press Club to find. Now, uh... In this highly charged situation, we've got to keep track of uh, a number of uh, significant events that are going on. Um, one is, of course, let me just restate it. I had to restate it again this week. Um, the question of Benghazi, the unbelievable stupidity uh, of the public life of this country when you have this continued debate uh, among people who, who pretend to know nothing. In other words, they can't even do a, uh, a simple word search on the, uh, on the Internet. And indeed, these Fox News reactionaries who think they have an issue with this Benghazi event, uh, continuing to harp on it, they want to know where did that story come from. Hey, go to your own website, Fox News. Go to your own website, and there you will find the... Uh, the entire lowdown that uh, this is a this is a briefing from General David Petraeus, uh, given several days after the event. General Petraeus came forward and told the House Intelligence Community that this is a uh, demonstration gone wild. Let's just see here. This is the, the article that I now have up on Press TV. You, and again, you can find this through uh, tarpley.net. will also take you to it. One authoritative source for the theory that the Benghazi attack was a protest demonstration gone violent was none other than CIA Director General David Petraeus, a figure who feels no special loyalty to Obama. Petraeus, of course, unites the Pentagon and the CIA, the networks, in a kind of personal union. According to a Fox News story dated September 27th, congressional source tells Fox News that CIA Director David Petraeus briefed the House intelligence community three days after the attack, espoused the view that Benghazi was an out-of-control demonstration prompted by a YouTube video. Read your own story, Fox News cretins. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So General David Petraeus, the focus of Bonapartist tendencies in this regime, right, the idea that the generals might eventually take over, and there is this undercurrent somehow that there's a difference of opinion between Dempsey and, uh, and Obama. Who knows what that could lead to? 
Things have gone much further than people think. A lot of things that people think are not possible are actually possible, and most people won't realize until they've actually happened. Uh, David Petraeus, during a news briefing, presumably on, on September 14th of last month, told the House intelligence community that, this, that Benghazi was an out-of-control demonstration prompted by a YouTube video. According to the source quoted by Fox News on their website, dated September 27th, this was shocking to some members who were present and saw the same intelligence as pointing to a terrorist attack. And what I say is, Petraeus is the darling of the neocons. He's the true love of the neocons. Now, he wasn't running. He didn't, uh, he didn't make the plunge, take the plunge. Um, you can see perhaps why. Uh, but maybe he figures there are alternate paths to power. Petraeus, the darling of those neocons, is supporting Romney, I believe. Uh, so is Petraeus using his position to help Romney against Obama? And that means, of course, is Petraeus actively allied with the CIA Mormon mafia inside of his own agency? Now, Petraeus is an active little fellow. Not only do we have the Benghazi event, and let's just pause again. The film at the bottom of this general pattern, right, the worldwide pattern of 25 countries, it's the film. And therefore, the film is important. It's not Sam Basile, it's Joseph Nasrallah. Nasrallah leads us to the Islamophobia network of Pamela Geller, and the key figure, the, the dominant person in this network is John Bolton, likely Secretary of State in a future Romney administration. We also know that the person who carried out, the organization that carried out the killing, is Sufyan Kumu, Guantanamo Bay graduate, U.S. double agent, swore allegiance to the U.S. as the price of getting out of Guantanamo. How else could you get out of Guantanamo except by becoming a double agent? Guantanamo is a training academy, not just all the other things you've heard. Now, we also have, as this article details, the 12-man CIA rapid response force, which was on the scene but did not intervene. CIA did not intervene. And the February 17th Martyrs Brigade, we've gone through that, in the contest between... Eunice and Hifter, the CIA man, to see who would become the head of the Libyan Armed Forces. It was Eunice against Hifter. The February 17th Martyrs Brigade intervened to kill Eunice and give dominance in the military sphere to Hifter, a notorious CIA asset. So to sum it up in the simplest terms, film comes from Romney campaign by a Bolton, by a Bolton. The story on the ground in Libya is CIA asset Kumu kills U.S. ambassador, while 12-man CIA team and security forces from the February 17th Martyrs Brigade stand by. Isn't there any Democrat out there, nobody who supports Obama, wants to, uh, to go with the obvious facts in the case? Well, in the meantime, we've got uh, General Petraeus. Uh, he's uh, trying to use this for empire building. He's... Uh, He's working this issue on, uh, on all sides, right? Petraeus obviously playing on all, all tables, the CIA boss. Washington Post, Tuesday, October 2nd. Al-Qaeda in Africa is under scrutiny. Secret meetings at the White House. Discussions include possible drone strikes. The White House has held a series of secret meetings in recent months to examine the threat posed by Al-Qaeda's franchise in North Africa and consider for the first time whether to prepare for unilateral strikes. Now, this is, if this weren't so tragic, it would be funny, because they're saying, oh, they uh, blew it in Libya, because Libya is now a terror base. We warned you about that here, right? You get a terror base in the Mediterranean, a couple of hundred miles from Italy, a little bit further from France and Greece and all the rest of it. Uh, and this is now under the control of Belhaj, Hasidi Hassadi, and Kumu, they're running wild. The deliberations reflect, writes the Washington Post, concern that al-Qaeda's African affiliate has become more dangerous since gaining control of large pockets of territory in Mali and acquiring weapons from post-revolutionary Libya. The discussions predate the September 11th attack on the U.S. compound in Libya, uh, but gained urgency after the assaults were linked to al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, AQIM, a new Al-Qaeda on the list of, with AQAP in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, this morning, Friday, October 19th, 
now we're getting specific what, what uh, Petraeus wants. It, it seems that when Petraeus was, was running things in Afghanistan, he had about 250 killer drones under his command that he was sending into Pakistan, into Iran, and elsewhere. Now we see a headline in the Washington Post, CIA seeking more drones, agency key in fighting terror, move would bolster, bolster paramilitary force. So the Pentagon has 250 killer drones. The CIA is not happy because they only have 30 to 35. And Petraeus is telling Obama, uh, is, is actually telling Brennan and I believe Donalon. By the way, if you want to know who put out lying stories about Libya, ask Donalon, right? The, uh, the head of the uh, National Security Council is a political hack. That's exactly the kind of thing that he would do, and then, you know, blame it on uh, General Clapper, General Clapper of the, uh, the intelligent czar. He's the, um, the fall guy for this week. Uh, so 250 for the Defense Department, only 30 to 35 for the CIA. The CIA also maintains a separate smaller fleet of stealth surveillance aircraft. Those are the ones that are sent over uh, Iran. So they want to escalate into all kinds of places in Africa. They want to make Africa into a playground for drones. And uh, this, means, uh, this means adding drones to the CIA fleet. And we're told that the, uh, of course, at the White House, we're still, we're still having Terror Tuesdays, right? We're still having Obama reviewing the various, uh, the various uh, targets and selecting who's going to die. Uh, we've just had a new airstrike in Yemen with drones, the 35th of the year, killed at least seven al-Qaeda-linked militants, say, of course, the, the CIA. Um, so you get the idea. This is all going on under Obama. Somehow, this does not find its way into the debates. Right? We haven't heard anything about drones because they all agree. Right? Obama and, and Romney agree on the drones. Now, uh, if we look at Syria, and in the background, of course, remember, it's October. If there's going to be another October surprise, uh, there could... Uh, be one in October. It's the month for the October surprise, and we're only halfway through the month. So Obama could easily go for an October surprise in Libya. This is now the buzz in a million different places, right? That if Obama wants to save himself, what he might well do is to carry out a strike with drones or seals or special forces whatever it is, in Libya, allegedly to kill the, peop to kill the people who killed Stephen. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So it's October, time for October surprise. If ever there's going to be an October surprise, it's got to come in the next two weeks between now and Halloween. So uh, two things, remember, get your copy of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America. Get it directly from Progressive Press. There are other ways, but go to ProgressivePress.com. If you can't find that, go to Tarpley.net. Click on the cover of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America. Buy a copy. Buy a print copy by all means. If you can't afford that, you can get an e-book for $6. And I, I cannot imagine someone who couldn't spare $6. If you listen to this program, if you value it, this is the obvious way both to support my work and the political dimension, to get that out into the world. Buy more than one copy, uh, send it to a, uh, an elected official, send it to a journalist, send it to, uh, send it to some relative or whatever it is. But use it for organizing. Use it to organize in whatever sphere is comfortable for you. All right, that's one. The other one is the big uh, United Front Against Fascism launching Sorry, against austerity. This, they're similar. United Front Against Austerity. That's going to be in New York City, October 27th at the INN World Report Auditorium, 56 Walker Street, Tribeca, oh, Lower Manhattan, from noon to 6. Go to Topley.net. Click on the UFAA logo at the top, and you will find it there. Uh, for those of you who can't come, we'll uh, try to make available some kind of a webcast of this. Um, 
but the webcast will probably not allow you to intervene. So the point is to come and actually have a programmatic discussion. We're leaving ample time for real debate, not fake debate, but real debate. So now, uh, the October surprise. This could be the obvious one. Given, given this campaign here in the Washington Post about the primacy of drones and the constant harping by the Republicans, right? Romney, Romney, who was supposed to run on jobs, 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 is now essentially spending more than half of his time ranting about an analysis, the timing of an analysis about an event that killed four people. Four people get killed in Afghanistan at least once this week. Um, it goes on all the time. Not ambassadors, to be sure, but sometimes fairly high-level officers. Somehow Romney has it in his head that he can use this to show that the White House lies, that the White House was uh, slipshod in providing security. This is ridiculous. The State Department is responsible for its own security. You know, Hillary Clinton, get, get her out. Sure, get her out. Above all, get, you want lying? It's Miss Rice at the U.N., the lack of security, Hillary Clinton, and then that the, uh, that the uh, entire Arab Spring, I guess, is, uh, is completely based on uh, terrorists. Well, there's a lot of truth in that, so I guess you can get Obama on that one. But uh, remember that Romney is supported by the same neocons who are behind this entire thing, and you can see it in the case of the uh, Islamophobia film, right? That's the group that raised such a brouhaha about having a mosque in Lower Manhattan, oh heavens, and, uh, and also about putting these awful, uh, uh, vulgar, scurrilous posters into the subway of New York, Washington, and San Francisco, accusing the Muslim pop- population of being savages. Well, those guys are barbarians, to put it mildly. Those are your neocons that surround uh, Romney, close friend of Netanyahu, as we've as we've discussed. Now, concerning Syria, uh, the insanity of Erdogan goes on, and I don't know where this ends, and it is a great threat to the world. I would appeal here, as I have done in the past, to rational forces within Turkey. It is time to restrain Erdogan. It's time to restrain him, to box him in, to get him out, to limit his power, to uh, neutralize him in any uh, politically uh, feasible way that can be, uh, can be attempted at this point. That is what the world uh, needs. And naturally, the economic progress of Turkey will be out the window in an instant if some kind of major altercation takes place. And it's also the entire diplomatic position of Davutoglu is, is infantile. You start a fire in your neighbor's house, and then you complain because the sparks are jumping back over into your house. This is ridiculous. But that's Davutoglu, the neo-Ottoman. Uh, not a good thing to be. Uh, better to be a neo Ataturk than a neo-Ottoman and realize that the Ottoman Empire is gone, finished, kaput, finish. Uh, you get the idea. Now, within the Syrian tragedy, what do we find? Brahimi the new uh, Algerian uh, UN envoy comes forward with a ceasefire plan, which is widely discussed. More than this, I, I can't say. Um, it may uh, may have some merit, but let's uh, let's see uh, whether this is going to be even-handed. He's supposed to go to Moscow and look them in the eye and say, "You've got to put an end to this." Well, why don't you go to Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and Qatar and look them in the eye? Uh, we've just had. Uh, a journalist jailed, four people actually jailed, for les majesté, for insulting the royal house, because they put out Twitters that were critical of King, uh, the, the King of, um, in this case, uh, Khalifa of, of Bahrain. So um, that's the level of, of those uh, events. Now, uh, inside... Syria, we still have a pattern, as far as I can see, of military defeat of the Free Syrian Army, right? 300 death squads split into three major factions. We actually have a report this morning of fighting among the jihadis, right? The death squads are fighting each other. Uh, But we've also got 
the uh, story here, Washington Post, as usual, pushing it. This is the Washington Post now of uh, Thursday, October 18th, yesterday. Alawite strains may test Assad, signs of unease among his own sect. So it's because a couple of shots were fired between two members of the extended Assad clan in Latakia, I believe, the um, uh, Alawite uh, heartland along the Mediterranean coast. This is very thin, but the, uh, the attempt here is to say that the discontent with Hafez Assad in this group is growing. It seems to me that given the military collapse of the Free Syrian Army and splitting and fighting among themselves now, these are, these are attempts to grab at straws on the part of the imperialists. Now, the other thing is the man pads. We're also told that efforts have been redoubled, I think, by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, to put the uh, SAMs, right, the shoulder-mounted anti-aircraft missiles, into the hands of the death squads, the so-called man pads, right, the, the manually operated uh, defense systems, right, this acronym. Uh, so these are the Stinger missiles. So the Stingers uh, go to the death squads. They shoot a few in Syria, but they get tired of that. Then they go to Kennedy Airport or uh, Charles de Gaulle or Heathrow or whatever it is. You get the picture. That's what it's going to be. And uh, the, 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 uh, the mental aridity of the CIA, right? having done this 30 years ago in Afghanistan, they can't think of anything else other than to do it again. Although the cover story is that the U.S. is trying to stop these shipments uh, and only the Saudis are pushing them because the U.S. wants them to go to the right death squads rather than the wrong death squads. So this uh, situation is not good. Now, the way in which it might end, uh, perhaps suggested here by the Washington Post headline of today, Friday, October 19th, Shiite protests royal Saudi Arabia. We haven't had coverage of this. Now, it's front page in the Washington Post. Escalating turmoil is troubling front for kingdom as it buys for regional supremacy. In other words, this Saudi thing has feet of clay. The Shiites are about to rebel. That's the burden of the, uh, of the story. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So, Shiite protests royal Saudi Arabia, right? This is the, uh, in particular, that Shiite cleric in the uh, in the eastern province, where all the oil is, uh, sandwiched between the vast Arabian desert and the glistening Persian Gulf, as the Washington Post waxes from Awamiya, Saudi Arabia. So the official story of Saudi Arabia is that the, uh, the death toll since the beginning of last year is 14 civilians killed, two police officers, lowball estimate. Uh, one killed is Khalid al-Labad, 26-year-old man, two teenage relatives, fatally shot by police as the victims were sitting in plastic chairs on the narrow sidewalk in front of their house in a small town in the far east of Saudi Arabia. To the police, Labad was a violent menace, but to uh, human rights advocates, he was a peaceful protester silenced by the government for demanding equal rights for the government's, for the country's oppressed Shiite Muslim minority. Uh, and a long uh, story here. First time, really, this has broken into the uh, Washington Post. Saudi rulers confront civil unrest in oil heartland. Um, this is the way in which the situation in the Middle East might normalize. And again, the uh, Bahrain, Les Majeste, you say anything about the king, you go to jail. You say anything about the prime minister, who's also a member of the royal family, right, these uh, caliphas, to jail with you. And, of course, the greatest hypocrisy between the public face and the actual reality, Qatar, the land of Al Jazeera, right, where the, the, uh, the Thanis, the Tanis, uh, rule with the same absolute monarchy. The thesis here, once again, these are places that are ripe for real revolutions. The overthrow of a monarchy is a revolution. 
Nazi, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and uh, there's also an English Revolution that at least uh, decapitated one Stuart, uh, James, the, uh, James uh, Charles the uh, First, in the in the 1600s. Uh, and unfortunately, they couldn't uh, make that stick, but. Uh, the uh, the result was that was a revolution too. So the classic revolution is to overthrow a monarchy, and the more absolute the monarchy is, the more authentic the revolution in question. So those are the ways, right? There are three possibilities: a mediated settlement, obviously with Russia and Iran playing a key role with those peacekeeping groups from the. Uh, Collective Security Treaty Organization, Russia, Kazakhstan, Armenia, and some others. That could be one way. Another way is simply the military defeat of the rebels. I think, we're again, we're seeing signs of that. And then the other way is that the powers that have been intervening most energetically get tied up at home. They have to direct their attentions, their energies, their resources, their arms, and their money to stabilizing their own shaky absolute thrones right more absolute than uh, than louis the 16th by far more absolute than louis the 14th or more absolute than peter the great well you you can go on with the comparisons but it's an absolute anachronism right a true relic of barbarism so this is uh some idea now of the uh of the situation in in the world and again the uh the big thing the big wild card is the uh october surprise predicated on uh events here in the united states now let's uh talk about a number of uh a number of issues here um they talked to a um a, a very interesting uh political leader yesterday, um, Reverend Pinckney in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Uh, this, Remember, we've gone into Benton Harbor and those issues quite a number of times, that this is the place where the fascist governor, Snyder, has imposed an austerity dictatorship, sending in a, uh, an austerity administrator, a kind of uh, committee of public safety in one man, uh, Benton Harbor cannot be relegated to simply a local or Michigan state issue. Benton Harbor and similar places are national and international issues. How can we have dictatorship in a, a, a number of cities in Michigan uh, when they're not even necessarily bankrupt? They're just judged by Snyder to be on the road to bankruptcy. So he sends in one of his rich friends who succeeds is then proceeds to sell off all the assets of the city and um, essentially put it put everything of value up for grabs right if there's some nice land along Lake Michigan then uh, then sell that to some developer to make it into a golf course or a gambling casino or whatever it's supposed to become these are the issues that are right now um, going towards you know unsatisfactory outcomes individually in a fragmented way and my my general thesis i want people to start thinking if you would about what this united front against uh, austerity would have to look like and and the idea is is um, simply this none of these struggles can really succeed on their own not the wisconsin working people not the chicago teachers not benton harbor not anything else you can mention unless you can parlay these, bring them together into a nationwide united front, at the very minimum, because what you really need is an international united front. Right? Canada is there. Europe is there. Right? There are similar things going on. There are lessons to be drawn from these places, and there's also the idea of how you could uh, act together. Can you imagine the effect of a transatlantic general strike can you imagine the effect of shutting down the United States, Canada, and Western Europe all on the same day, even if it's just for a day, with a program? Whatever the program is, if it's a serious program, 
that would then go on the national agenda of quite a few countries. That would then be an idea whose time has come. Don't listen to the Occupy Wall Street anarchists, the ad busters, the fakers, the, uh, the uh, fakers from Vancouver, British Columbia, who will tell you, oh, no, you can't have a program. That might lead to getting co-opted. Well, <laughs> look, look what happened to Occupy Wall Street. It has basically ceased to exist. Uh, don't have a program, they tell you. Don't have leaders. Don't have an organization. Don't have a strategy. Just go camp in the park and have fun. Well, that's, that has been tried now, and that was a pretty ignominious and dismal failure. And we'll rue the day that all of that energy and all of that time from 2011, the entire autumn of 2011, was basically junked, thrown out the window for nothing. And we're told, oh, but they changed the national conversation yeah, this is, this is cold comfort. The national conversation is always changing. It's always changing, right? If it's not Lady Gaga, then it's going to be baby uh, whatever her name is, right? Um, there's some, some, somebody that Obama referenced in, this, uh, in the, the um, Al Smith dinner last night. That, uh, some, you know, if it's not Snooky, it's Lady Gaga, or whatever it is. So this, this gets us nowhere. Now, um, when you look at these issues, uh, think of things like um, the drones, right? Can you organize a nationwide mass movement uh, on a class basis to stop the drones? No, you can't. And you've got to be extremely realistic about this, right? Hard-headed, realpolitik is needed. We tried this in Vietnam. You could not organize a movement to seize power or parts of power, right? And again... I think a good benchmark is about 80 members of the House of Representatives, let's say 80 to 100 members of the House of Representatives and half a dozen senators in your first year or two of operations. That would mean you're on the way to taking some power. You couldn't do that in Vietnam. You couldn't do that with 9-11. But the Tea Party did it, with obviously with more money, but really fewer people. You could do that if you had the things that I say. Back in a minute. Welcome back to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Two big things you should do. First of all, buy a copy of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America. Do it now. It's urgent. The election is now about two weeks away. Register, inform yourself, and vote, they used to say back in the good old days. So now inform yourself. You know about Obama? If you haven't read my two books on Obama, Obama, the Postmodern Coup, The Making of a Manchurian Candidate, boy, that one has everything in there about the color revolutions. It essentially gives you the guide, the program for uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, and so forth, and running into trouble in Libya and Syria. But uh, that's all in there, the entire question of the color revolution is a whole big chapter well anyway that's for obama you want to know, <coughs> want to know about <coughs> excuse me obama that's in there and then you've got barack h obama the unauthorized biography you want to know all about his relations to the weather people <laughs> that is to say uh bernadine dorn and bill ayers that's still extremely relevant I don't think anything really important has been added by any of the books that appeared after Obama got into the White House. <coughs> one, one guy took uh, the Manchurian, he made him into the Manchurian president instead of Manchurian candidate. But uh, that's not much of a difference. So essentially everything, everything relevant is already in these books. So that was two years ago and still absolutely relevant if you don't if you have questions about Obama, those are the books to get. But far fewer people know anything about Romney, and that's where you've got to get just too weird Bishop Romney and the Mormon takeover of America. Go to Progressive Press, buy it. Paper copies are, are now shipping, right? The paper copies are now in the pipeline, right? They're moving across the landscape. Um, will, people will, if you bought in the first wave, you'll be getting yours soon. There's also a $6 ebook. Come on, $6 for an ebook. Get it before the price goes up because it won't stay 
$6 eternally. Then the other thing, you got to think about attending the October 27th uh, meeting in Manhattan, New York City. It's the United Front Against Austerity. We're going to talk more about that. That's actually what we're talking about right now. That's going to be a programmatic uh, debate and uh, organizing meeting to hammer out strategy for uh, really setting up a line of defense against, uh, against the coming assault of the austerity ghouls. Now, on this, um, and so please come to that. And remember then, uh, the um, people in the Washington area come to the press club on Halloween, Halloween at the press club, Kolob at the press club on October 31st of uh, this, this month, the end of the month, Halloween, 6.30 if you want dinner, 7.30 if you're just coming for the speech, uh, and that will be Mitt Romney's Mormon background, and uh, it'll, it'll be inclusive. Now, just concerning the, the austerity stuff, uh, we're told here that uh, Obama is threatening behind the scenes to veto any legislation dealing with the fiscal cliff and the grand bargain and uh, Simpson Bowles, right, the Cat Food Commission, uh, the um, 12 Tyrants, remember them, the Crapo Commission in the Senate. Obama says he will veto any year-end tax hikes and spending cuts that do not include tax increases on the richies, administration officials say. This is reported in the Washington Post of uh, yesterday. So uh, Obama saying that he will let the uh, what is built into the baked in the cake, as they say, right, set in stone now, the abolition of the Mad Dog Bush tax cuts and the, uh, the automatic sequestration left over from the 12 tyrants, right, the super committee. Uh, however, he, he's unwilling to say what he'd do if he loses the election. Uh, now, that's interesting, because it's, it's somehow there's, it's, it's a question of high principle if he gets reelected, but then if he doesn't get reelected, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, Republicans will be unable to stop these automatic increases alone. And what it, what it means is it's a 4%, 5% increase. It, the current rate for the top Richies is about 35%, and with the, if you go back to the Clinton pre-Bush tax, tax rates for them, it's 40%. So this somehow is the end of the world for these plutocrats, right? If there ever were a bunch of pampered crybabies, it's these plutocrats. Um, Republicans, however, <laughs> are already skeptical because Obama is notoriously a coward. From our point of view, what, he, what this really means is Obama is, is really saying, I demand some tiny token, you know, 4%, increase in taxes on the super rich uh, who generally don't they're not paying it on income right they're getting it on the side the way romney does right carried interest capital gains 15 percent or less he manages to do with his tax shelters and he he's very self-righteous about it the the um method of obama is to use a tiny nick on the super rich which doesn't even interfere with their luxuries much less their amenities and their necessities. He'll bargain that against killer cuts, genocidal austerity against people lower on the totem pole. It will cut into the necessities of the poor while failing to even scratch the uh, opulent uh, and sybaritic luxuries of the super plutocrats like Romney at the top. So anyway, that's his plan, but then the Republicans aren't, aren't even taking him seriously. Some Republicans, writes the Washington Post, some Republicans noting that the president has backed off demands for higher taxes twice in the past, are skeptical that he will stand firm now. <laughs> it's probably a good bet. So that's one of the reasons we need the uh, United Front against austerity. We don't want the Cat Food Commission. That's the Simpson Bowles, right? Simpson is an elderly misanthrope who hates people. Bowles is a Morgan Stanley 
rip-off artist, hedge fund hyena, zombie banker, whatever. He's basically the same as Romney, or maybe worse than Romney. So we don't want that. We don't want this cat food commission. We don't want the crapo commission, meeting the, the gang of 12, as I think they are now in the Senate. And we don't want the 12 tyrants. We don't care about this. And we're not willing to cut food stamps in order to restore defense cuts. That's, that simply makes no, no sense. We want to cut through all of this with the Wall Street sales tax. 1% Wall Street sales tax on all turnover. The turnover is in the quadrillions. We can't really be sure what the yield would be, but the very, very modest, much smaller uh, New York State uh, securities tax is thought to yield 20 to 30 billion a year, which, of course, the cowardly governors of New York State, including Hugh Carey, Cuomo the Elder, Cuomo the Younger, and everyone, Governor Potato Head there, Pataki, they've all uh, remitted that. They give it back to Wall Street because they don't want them to go to New Jersey, which where they're not going anyway, but there we go. So this is now the, uh, the, the situation. So what we need is a, um, an, a mass movement based on economic issues. Now, the reason that you can't do this based on a foreign war unless it's a really big war like World War I with millions and millions of casualties. And it cannot be done around an event like 9-11. And I say this with a certain authority. I've tried both. I've tried this in the 1960s and 70s with Vietnam, and I've tried it with, uh, with the 9-11 with the, uh, movement. That does not work. In order to get a mass movement, people have to be fighting for themselves and their own lives. That is the only way they're going to mobilize the energy and indeed take the risks that are inherent in a serious political mass movement. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So, this is the question now. Uh, what we have right now is a, is a fragmented political landscape. First of all, we have the void, right? Uh, Obama has no left credibility, uh, and, and thanks in part to the, uh, the efforts of the people at the Black Agenda Report, Glenn Ford, and others, they just had a very successful... Uh, gathering at Riverside Church with uh, Cornell West, and uh, they have been instrumental in, at least in, in terms of uh, the uh, significant parts of the black community, in opening their eyes to the fact that, that Obama is in reality a disadvantage, that uh, the fact that he's there makes it easier to tromp on the black community, because he is the one president that will never m make a serious uh, protest or do anything to stop this. Uh, th that is certainly uh, the, the, the case then with uh, with Obama. But um, at the same time, I think it's important to realize the uh, the profile of Romney is actually more threatening. Uh, when the new administration comes in, it comes in with a huge amount of criminal energy and a huge impulse. Right? They have the big momentum of having won the election or stolen the election or whatever it is. We could then expect that if Romney does come in, he'll come in with a Republican House and Senate, in other words, one-party government for most likely two years, unless some defection can be arranged along the lines of uh, that senator from Vermont uh, almost 10 years ago. I would say to people uh, all over the political spectrum, if you want to be considered a leader under a Romney administration, which is now eminently possible, you want to be a leader against Romney, you better do your work now. You better show right now that you're not supporting Romney. And then it means, for example, if you only attack Obama and make that everything, that's, it's going to be hard to have the moral authority to then turn around and oppose uh, Romney. I recommend clearly oppose Obama. I've tried to do that. I dedicated the first half of this to opposing Obama's drone strike policy in Africa. Absolutely unacceptable and uh, has to be opposed. At the same time, we've got to uh, use the abundant materials we have to show what a Rom Romney regime would look like. Uh, now, it certainly is true that if Romney gets in, there's going to be a tremendous upheaval and in some ways, the task of mass organizing would be different. But it's time to start that now. And it's time to show the people, the people that the, the political forces that are willing to say no to Obama, no to Romney, it seems although, to me that are, are the ones that are likely to 
to uh, have the best uh, moral and political position if Romney uh, seizes control of the government, which, again, is eminently possible. So we have really two models, right? The existing model is the fragmented model, the parochial model. Every group has one or two issues that they seek to, to, uh, to propose. What I want to counterpose to that is the idea of a class-based mass movement based on economic issues that would also then, in due course, uh, become the field in which these other single issues could probably be realized. For example, take the drones. You can't seize power in the U.S. You can't build a mass movement saying no drones in Africa, no drones in the Middle East, stop the CIA, shut them down. That can't be done. What can be done is, in this situation of economic breakdown, using the kind of program that I have tried to, uh, to illustrate, you can build a mass movement that will then have a foreign policy that will indeed include ending the drones and similarly reforms on the domestic front and so forth. But the only way that works is if people can come together and say, as I think most surveys seem to indicate, that depression, unemployment, economic misery, lack of health care, uh, the inability to, uh, to pay for education, these are the main hegemonic issues at the center of public life. And these other issues can prosper if they're attached to a mass movement that's solving the big, the big issues uh, that, uh, that are plaguing just about everybody. Um, for example, one, one very good, uh, good case study of this, we're, we're told now that Panetta is aware that the student loan crisis is a threat to national security. This is a fascinating story. The Secretary of Defense is now uh, somehow of saying, he's aware, he's been made aware, that the, the tremendous burden of student loans on active duty and uh, active reserve members of the U.S. Armed Forces is now interfering with their preparedness. Now, uh, since we're in the season uh, of Antietam and the pre-announcement of the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, let me just point out, it's much easier for a president to, uh, if it's a president of goodwill like Lincoln, to use a military emergency for the most sweeping progressive steps, such as the abolition of slavery, uh, at least wherever that could be done uh, as a war measure. Once you call it a war measure, <laughs> lots of things become possible. So here's what we have in the Washington Post of actually today. U.S. military officials voiced concern Thursday over American troops mounting student loan debt, saying loan companies appear to be guiding them away from special protection they earn through their services. Forty-one percent of the armed forces have student loans to repay. This is causing anxiety among the troops. Sometimes they're more worried about their student loans than about uh, the war and combat. All right. How do you address that? I'll tell you how. A student loan amnesty, a five-year freeze on all principal and interest, five years or the duration of this depression, whichever lasts longer. And uh, we need somebody uh, to call the end of the depression who's not a fool, not a bond salesman like Bill Gross or El Arian. We don't need bond salesmen or, or libertarians uh, making that, that call. So... Uh, there's an issue <laughs> where you could get the military on your side uh, and, and quite a few others, uh, and, and indeed the entire student population. These are issues with absolute mass traction. They need to be assembled into a coherent program that also meets the scientific test. Will it produce a recovery? Well, this is a contribution to an economic recovery because... If you don't have a student loan amnesty of this type for five years, human life itself comes to a halt. Kids live at home. They can't get married. There are no children. They can't, can, they can't uh, produce uh, um, their um, the, uh, educational results that they need. In other words, the entire machinery of human life comes to a halt. For what? Because of debt. And, of course, the libertarians will scream, that debt is sacred. Well, no, sorry. That is not sacred, and that's the policy of the United Front Against Austerity, 
uh, if, if I'm uh, able to uh, convince people at this meeting, which I hope you'll come and join me in doing. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Now, some other uh, considerations. Right, You need a mass movement that can act as a political strike support operation. Intervene in a strike. Bring in outside forces that are not in that union. Bring in unemployed and especially black and Hispanic and other unemployed. So you get the ethnic diversity so that you can appeal to the entire community. Uh, some of these are local struggles, like the Benton Harbor, Michigan struggle is essentially against a fascist dictatorship exercised from uh, Lansing, Michigan, on these different communities. So you've got trade union struggles, you've got these local struggles, you've got student struggles trying to do something about this crushing debt. That's been big in uh, California. The obvious means of uniting these, the, the answer in just about every one of those cases is the Wall Street sales tax. It is the most fundamental agitational question. We have a depression. Who will pay for the depression? Wall Street, the Cat Food Commission, the Crapo Commission, Simpson Bowles, the 12 Tyrants, the Super Committee all say working people pay for the depression with token, you know, the debate is all about how big of a token uh, hit Nick will the super-rich plutocrats uh, take? That is, of course, uh, not satisfactory. Uh, so therefore, you've got to cut through that. Whenever you make a demand as a public sector union, whenever you're demanding a social service, the comeback from the reactionary is always, who's going to pay for that? Wall Street will pay. And the, the terrain is, I think, ripe uh, for that. So without that programmatic element, you lose. Isn't it obvious? With that programmatic element, you can then draw in others who want that to be um, to become uh, the, the law of the land, right? And they want their part of those benefits. Nobody is ever going to have a nationwide mass movement capable of contending for power based on foreign policy issues or uh, issues about secret government uh, operations, important as they may be in detonating or changing mass psychology. Here's another one. Karl Rove is associated with the idea of a permanent Republican majority. Now, when he says a permanent Republican majority, what he means is a permanent austerity dictatorship of the Republican Party. And that's just a sociological fact. If you're going to have a, a, an austerity dictatorship, it is going to be the Republican Party, the party of the petty bourgeoisie, the low-wage sweatshop employers, of Wall Street, of uh, the biggest uh, corporations, and so forth. Sociologically, that's how you would impose genocidal austerity and a permanent austerity dictatorship. You can't do that with the Democratic Party, not permanently, because they've got unions in there, they've got women's groups, they've got black groups, Hispanic groups, they've got a, they've got a million different groups. The Democratic Party has accentuated its character as a confederation of interest groups. That's one of the, one of the problems in organizing the class-wide broad front. But that, let's just look at uh, how close Karl Rove is to realizing his plan. Well, he's too close uh, for my comfort anyway. First of all, remember, the Republican Party is demographically doomed. That's the other thing, is that this is going to be a narrow-based austerity dictatorship. That's what we see with Romney. Neocons on the foreign policy side and Mormons on the domestic and economic side, all chosen by Mike Levitt. Now, with that typical uh, Mormon white supremacist Jim Crow attitude, accompanying Romney in his march towards the White House is this uh, effort at voter suppression. So the voter suppression, voter intimidation. Billboards say it's a felony to vote. Um, voter ID, when there was no voter ID for decades, and there is no problem of voter fraud. Let me make that distinction. The term is vote fraud, not voter fraud. Vote fraud done by Karl Rove, not voter fraud done by some little schmuck who wants to vote twice. This makes no sense. Vote fraud comes from the top, and we had it in Florida in 2000, and we had it in Ohio, God knows, in 2004. Look at the Fatrakis studies of what went on 
in Ohio, right, under that um, Republican, uh, the black Republican who was the Secretary of State of Ohio. Secretary of State of, of Ohio is always the vote fraud king, unless the uh, corresponding person in Florida gets in there. So the voter, voter suppression, voter intimidation is they want ID, they want to abolish early voting, even when they're forced to do it, as we've seen this week, they come up with crazy hours. They above all, they don't want it to be open on Sunday morning so the black church can simply march its congregation over to the voting place, the polling place, and vote. They want to make that harder. It only starts at, I think, 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the Sunday before the election. So the voter ID, the early voting is interfered with. There are purges, right? They bring in, we've just had that too. Corrupt, even criminal Republican enterprises come in and purge people from the voter rolls. And then you get the, the, uh, the lowest level of this is don't have enough voting machines, have long lines, have chaos at the polls. People give up. They go home, especially if it's raining. Uh, they're going to give up and go home. And those are the voters that the Republicans want to suppress. Now, interesting article here in the current issue of Harper's Magazine. Harper's Magazine uh, for what? For uh, November 2012. How to rig an election. The GOP aims to paint the country red by Victoria Collier. Now, this is a useful summary of recent vote fraud, right? All those things that we used to talk about, Sequoia, about how Chuck Hagel got going, or this wonderful, respected uh, man, but he was, of course, the uh, chief executive of a company that then uh, apparently carried out vote fraud in Nebraska. Uh, we had at one point... Uh, in uh, Florida, in 2000, one county reported 16,000 negative votes for Gore. <laughs> and, of course, Gore was falling all over himself trying to surrender, uh, but then he, uh, he had to pull back for a while. But you get the idea. There's a, a, a complete story here um, about Ohio in 2004. Lou Harris of the Harris Poll, right? Quote, Ohio 2004 was as dirty an election as America has ever seen. Now, the vote fraud uh, can't do the job in a wave election, right? The wave election submerges the, the vote fraud. The vote fraud cannot really be enough without, without getting caught. But now it's a uh, very, very close election. The vote fraud will come into its own. I would, er, you could do worse than looking at this How to Rig an Election by Victoria Collier in Harper's Magazine. It's at least a... Uh, a quick uh, overview, and then you can follow up, you know, the more detailed, more, uh, more radical, certainly more radical studies uh, online. So you've got all of those things going. Then you've got Citizens United. You've got the Super PACs. You've got the Koch brothers, Soros, all these people pouring in money. That obviously uh, makes it difficult. We're just, we're just looking at the, um, the third parties, right? Jill Stein and uh, uh, Sherry Hunkala for the Greens. Then we got Virgil Good for the Constitution Party. We've got uh, the um, we've got uh, Gary Johnson for the Libertarians. He's he's a clone of Ron Paul. And then you got this guy Rocky Anderson, I believe. Rocky Anderson, it looks to me, is a uh, LDS Mormon uh, wingman. He's Romney's left wingman because he's out there on the left attacking Obama, as far as I can see in the the, the samples that I've seen of. Uh, of Rocky Anderson, he's he's supposedly the non-Mormon far, former mayor of uh, of Salt Lake City. Well, in the 1850s, right, if you were a uh, a nor you know if you were from a free state, but you acted as if you were from a slave state, you were a doe face, and maybe the doe face is what we need to call people who who are maybe not Mormon, like Karl Rove himself, right? Karl Rove grew up in Salt Lake City. He's a non-Mormon Mormon, and maybe that's Rocky Anderson too, out there. Uh, attacking Obama on these uh, occasions. Very, very interesting. So we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So, just to sum it up, Karl Rove's permanent dictatorship, right, the permanent austerity dictatorship, would almost have to be the, so, the uh, Republican Party, at least as the facade, right, and behind it, it would be General Petraeus uniting the Pentagon and the intelligence community. But in terms of the, uh, the party, right, that would be the Republicans, more or less. And so now we have the vote suppression, vote intimidation, 
the things that I've just detailed. You got Citizens United pouring in money. They will have new cases of this tar- It also turns out that with Citizens United, the boss can force you to go to a political meeting, force you to do um, some kind of a s- rectification session on the Maoist model. Um, don't don't wait for the libertarians to bring this stuff up, right? Because it's being done by bosses to workers, right? They don't care about that. And then the Supremes, right? If Romney gets in, he'll have one or two Supremes to name. New Scalias, right? As uh, as Scott Brown up in uh, Massachusetts said, the, the, the justice that he likes is Scalia. And then he uh, he tried to uh, muddy the waters after that. But now, as persuasive as all this is, right? This is a scary perspective. The people you're going to get on that package of issues, I'm afraid, is not Joe Sixpack. It's not the average working family. It's the petty bourgeois good government types. And with that, you can't contend for power. And that's the goal. We want to uh, do the one strategy that might work. All the other strategies have been tried and failed. The anarchist method, the libertarian method, the uh, left-wing democratic method. We're talking... Political strike support, class-wide program, hard-hitting, and adequate to, to get a, a recovery, right? Not radical for the sake of being radical, but radical enough and just radical enough to get an economic recovery going, because that's the goal. Survival. That's what, that's what our program is. We can show society how to survive. Others cannot, because these other things don't work economically. Austerity is bad because it's cruel and genocidal, and it also doesn't work in its own terms. It does not solve the deficit. So the answer to this is, even with a package of dictatorship, you will not get a mass movement unless you include the economic policies of the dictatorship, which are, of course, genocidal austerity. Genocidal austerity would be the purpose of Karl Rove's austerity dictatorship. Now, I've, I've seen people this week... They're worried about Obama giving telephones to welfare victims. Well, first of all, there is no more welfare, people. Wake up. Welfare ended in 1996 with Bill Clinton. There is no more welfare. So telephones to welfare victims, this makes me laugh. A telephone, a basic uh, cell phone, is uh, 20 bucks, 25 bucks. So we're supposed to be aghast that they give... uh, a telephone to a welfare victim. Maybe they're trying to help that person to get a job, right? Maybe that's the way you could call potential employers and receive calls from them. Maybe you can't afford to have a telephone at home. It's amazing stuff. And then we're supposed to be worried, will there be black riots if Obama uh, loses the election? Well, if it's by, by massive vote fraud, as the, the signs seem to indicate here, from Romney on down, then we need a general strike. Forget about riots. We better have a general strike at that point. Now, Romney, in my opinion, is a sick character. Um, In the course of the research for Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America, what we find is that that Romney likes to dress up in uniforms. Uh, He seems to to derive an uh, insatiable uh, fascination from getting dressed up in uniforms, and he, uh, he was going to college in California. He brought with him the uniform of a Michigan state trooper that his uh, father, George Romney, soft on fascism, had, uh, had given him. And he went out, put a light on the top of his car, and went out and harassed motorists, sometimes just people who were passing by. Sometimes, the cases we know, these were people that he was going to college with, right? If they were parked in Lover's Lane, then uh, with, with, a, with a bottle of whiskey or something, then Romney would delight in going out and making and scaring the living daylights out of these people by, uh, by pretending to be a cop. He's also an extreme Scrooge. This is absolutely pathological. This reminds me of the Rockefeller family. It was always said that the inhuman cruelty of John D. Rockefeller, the, the old one, right, with the dimes, um, meant that the, uh, th- there was this obsession with collecting things, right? Collections, often uh, neurotic uh, symptom. In the case of uh, Romney, he is Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, he, he would say to people, uh, if they were having uh, lunch at an outdoor cafe, 
uh, let's buy a bottle of Perrier. No, said Romney, and he would run over to the 7-Eleven and buy a six-pack of mineral water and bring it back so you didn't have to pay the inflated prices. <coughs> he would, in his campaign, the Washington Post says that he flew economy in the entire first phase of his campaign. And now we've got another story here recently that Romney is obsessed with the points, not the five points in his economic program, but his Marriott rewards points, his frequent flyer points from the Marriott uh, frequent hotel guest card. This is the big issue for Romney. Also, this thing about harassing the gay student at Cranbrook School, hazing, harassment, and so forth. Romney is sick. This, I think, compares not favorably with the catalog we could make for, uh, for Obama. But actually, for Obama, uh, perhaps we have time for, for Obama. We've got uh, Mo Dowd, always interesting, right? Maureen Dowd of the New York Times. Um, she's telling us here, Barack Obama basically doesn't like people. When he speaks at rallies, he doesn't want the stage cluttered with other office holders who would support him. When he rides in his limo, he doesn't want to give rides to local politicians. He, he doesn't owe his ascension to anybody else, not a rich daddy, not a spouse, not a father, not even to those who helped him. He believes that he could do any job in the White House of the campaign better than the ones who are doing the job. So he ought to know that he's responsible for his lousy debate performance. Um, according to Mo Dowd, Valerie Jarrett uh, is responsible. She babies him. Jarrett is the personality cult, right? She's the yes. Remember we had this with Bush that he had a bunch of women telling him how great he was, right, in the, in the White House. Jarrett believes that everyone must woo the prodigy who deigns to guide us and not the other way around. So uh, that doesn't look too good. Now, so Obama has his problems, but I think this thing about getting dressed up in the state trooper's uniform, this has fascistoid overtones. If we have time, and you, you could certainly get this in... Uh, in uh, the uh, Just Too Weird book, you will see that George Romney was soft on fascism, worked for the two industries in the United States that were most interested in maintaining their Nazi cartels uh, well into 1941, into 1942. That's the aluminum industry and the automobile industry. And then George Romney, the governor of Michigan, who ran his campaigns based on moral rearmament of a guy called Frank Buchmann, you can hear this today in Ryan, and generally the Republican Party in general, that Hitler was not the problem, but the moral decay of the West was the problem. This is what Franco went with, in particular in Spain and Pétain in, in, uh, in France, of course. But this does not deter the chaplain of power. Billy Graham has, of course, been rendering unto Caesar for a long time. And this chaplain, he was, of course, chaplain to Nixon during Watergate, to... Bill Clinton during his impeachment, and on and on. We have uh, the meeting now finally between Mitt Romney and Billy Graham. And uh, Billy Graham says he will do all I can to help Mitt. And then Billy Graham's website removed a statement branding Mormonism as a cult because its teachings deviate from the biblical message of the Christian faith. So there it is. Uh, Selling Christ for Power, the specialty of, of Billy Graham. The other one, just uh, in conclusion, Dinesh D'Souza. Dinesh D'Souza, the uh, creator of this awful movie, 2016, uh, has now lo he's been fired uh, by King's College in New York, a profoundly religious institution, because Dinesh, a scholar-activist, uh, checked into a hotel during an evangelical conference um, with a new girlfriend when he ha still was married. Dinesh, has he been so drawn into, into Romney's orbit that he was attempting polygamy? In other words, he was married and he had a, a live-in girlfriend at the hotel at the evangelical conference. Um, the divorce is not final. So is he trying polygamy? Interesting questions in Tribeca near Canal Street. And uh, go to the, uh, the website of that, right? Go to the website of the United Front Against Austerity. You don't know where that is. You can reach it through my website. Go to tarpley.net. Everybody knows tarpley.net. 
click at the UFAA, United Front Against Austerity, logo on the top, and that will take you directly to that um, the full details on that event, right? A small contribution will be uh, requested. Uh, nobody will be turned away. Uh, if you're unemployed or a student or something, uh, do do come along, and, and uh, there's there's room for uh, for everybody at that rate. This is about mass organizing. This is about mass organizing based on life and death economic issues. Other questions, however meritorious, have got to be um, subordinated. To that. So those are the two big things. Uh, the, the book, Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America, get it from Progressive Press. Buy a paper copy by all means, but if you can't afford a paper copy, $6 for an electronic copy. I think that's within the reach of just about everybody listening to this program. And the other question then is the October 27th uh, event in New York City the United Front Against Fascism. And remember, if you're in the Washington area, there's also the Halloween, Halloween at the Press Club, Kolob at the Press Club, uh, 6.30 if you want dinner, uh, which there is a fee for, of course, and then uh, <coughs> 7.30 to hear the, uh, the presentation and the discussion. That's the McClendon Group. It's in the McClendon Room. Ask them for the McClendon Room when you get there. It's one of the harder rooms of the many rooms of the Press Club to find. Now, uh, in this highly charged situation, we've got to keep track of uh, a number of uh, significant events that are going on. Um, One is, of course, let me just restate it. I had to restate it again this week. Um, The question of Benghazi, the unbelievable stupidity uh, of the public life of this country, when you have this continued debate uh, among people who, who pretend to know nothing, in other words, they can't even do a, uh, a simple word search on the, uh, on the Internet. And indeed, these Fox News reactionaries who think they have an issue with this Benghazi event, uh, continuing to harp on it, they want to know where did that story come from. Hey, go to your own website, Fox News. Go to your own website, and there you will find the uh, the entire lowdown. That uh, this is a this is a briefing from General David Petraeus, uh, given several days after the event. General Petraeus came forward and told the House Intelligence Community that this is a uh, demonstration gone wild. Let's just see here. This is the, the article that I now have up on Press TV. You, and again, you can find this through uh, tarpley.net. will also take you to it. One authoritative source for the theory that the Benghazi attack was a protest demonstration gone violent was none other than CIA Director General David Petraeus, a figure who feels no special loyalty to Obama. Petraeus, of course, unites the Pentagon and the CIA, the networks, in a kind of personal union. According to a Fox News story dated September 27th, congressional source tells Fox News that CIA Director David Petraeus briefed the House intelligence community three days after the attack, espoused the view that Benghazi was an out-of-control demonstration prompted by a YouTube video. Read your own story, Fox News cretins. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So General David Petraeus, the focus of Bonapartist tendencies in this regime, right? the idea that the generals might eventually take over, and there is this undercurrent somehow that there's a difference of opinion between Dempsey and, uh, and Obama. Who knows what that could lead to? Things have gone much further than people think. A lot of things that people think are not possible are actually possible, and most people won't realize until they've actually happened. Uh, David Petraeus, during a news briefing, presumably on, on September 14th of last month, told the House intelligence community that, this, that Benghazi was an out-of-control demonstration prompted by a YouTube video. According to the source quoted by Fox News on their website, dated September 27th, this was shocking to some members who were present and saw the same intelligence as pointing to a terrorist attack. And what I say is, 
Petraeus is the darling of the neocons. He's the true love of the neocons. Now, he wasn't running. He didn't, uh, he didn't make the plunge, take the plunge. Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. It's the 19th of October, and uh, we have two, two or three big events coming up. Uh, essentially, the main themes of our broadcast today are, are the following two. First of all, you must get a copy of... Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America, Polygamy, Theocracy, and Subversion from Progressive Press of California. You need to go to ProgressivePress.com, ProgressivePress.com. You can reach it through my website. Go to Tarpley.net and click on the cover of Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of of America, polygamy, theocracy, and subversion. People have often asked me, how can you support my work? You uh, like my work. You think it's valuable. Now's the time to show it. Buy that book. And uh, because of the uh, wonders of e-books, you could get a copy of the book for as little as $6. Now, I think that's, uh, that's a trivial amount for just about anybody. Uh, if you really support this broadcast, if you want to do something to facilitate what I do, to add some authority and some, uh, some uh, mass impact to the work of uh, putting this out under circumstances that were not that easy, go and buy the book. <laughs> buy more than one. Buy some for holiday giving, all kinds of holidays coming up, right? Get one to give to somebody at Thanksgiving. The uh, year-end giving season is, uh, is upon us very soon. Christmas is coming, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, all the rest, right? Any excuse to buy just too weird Bishop Romney and the Mormon takeover of America. So support me, support me by buying that book. Uh, I need your help. Go out and do it now, or sit down and do it now. Uh, apropos of the book and the general theme of Romney, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, we can now announce on Halloween, Halloween night, October 31st, you can come to the National Press Club. That's on uh, 14th Street down by the Department of Commerce uh, in, in downtown D.C. It's not far from the U.S. Treasury. It's not far from the White House. It's the National Press Club. You can find it pretty easily. Uh, in the McClendon Room, which is a little bit hard to find, it's sort of behind the kitchen in a certain way, but uh, it's the McClendon Room, and there we have meeting the McClendon Group, and this is a group that uh, for many years has had uh, seminars on uh, Wednesday nights, generally. I am invited to the McClendon Group in the McClendon Room of the National Press Club on Halloween night, on uh, uh, October 31st. If you want to come and get dinner, you come at 6.30 p.m., if you just want to come for the speech, come an hour later, come about 7.30. And it will be a summary of these uh, questions, uh, the, quest the same material that is presented, or much some of the same, a sampling of the material, which is presented in the Just Too Weird Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America. So that's Halloween night, October 31st, Halloween at the Press Club. Halloween, uh, the Kolob, Kolob comes to the press club for Halloween. So uh, that's something I think that some people around here may be interested in. If people want to know, is there a ch are there um, you know, public discussions of this book? Well, I'm sure the book will come up uh, in this. Uh, they, 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 strictly speaking, the title is uh, Mitt Romney's Mormon Background, for various reasons. That's the... Uh, the title of this appearance. I uh, urge you to come if you're in the Washington, D.C. area. And then, of course, uh, even uh, sooner, on October 27th, which it turns out this is the anniversary of the last Saturday of the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 27th in New York City, that's going to be the, uh, 
the uh, meeting that we've been talking about organizing for for quite a while. It's the meeting of the United Front Against Austerity, October 27th, a week from tomorrow. So by the time you hear this broadcast, that will be uh, ongoing. Uh, it'll be the following Saturday. So October 27th, from noon to 6, at the INN World Report Auditorium, 56 Walker Street. Um, you can see perhaps why, uh, but maybe he figures there are alternate paths to power. Petraeus, the darling of those neocons, is supporting Romney, I believe. Uh, so is Petraeus using his position to help Romney against Obama? And that means, of course, is Petraeus actively allied with the CIA Mormon Mafia inside of his own agency? Now, Petraeus is an active little fellow. Not only do we have the Benghazi event, and let's just pause again. The film at the bottom of this general pattern, right, the worldwide pattern of 25 countries, it's the film. And therefore, the film is important. It's not Sam Basile, it's Joseph Nasrallah. Nasrallah leads us to the Islamophobia network of Pamela Geller, and the key figure, the, the dominant person in this network is John Bolton, like the Secretary of State in a future Romney administration. We also know that the person who carried out, the organization that carried out the killing, is Sufian Kumu, Guantanamo Bay graduate, U.S. double agent, swore allegiance to the U.S. as the price of getting out of Guantanamo. How else could you get out of Guantanamo except by becoming a double agent? Guantanamo is a training academy, not just all the other things you've heard. Now, we also have, as this article details, the 12-man CIA Rapid Response Force, which was on the scene but did not intervene. CIA did not intervene. And the February 17th Martyrs Brigade, we've gone through that, in the contest between... Yunus and Hifter, the CIA man, to see who would become the head of the Libyan Armed Forces. It was Yunus against Hifter. The February 17th Martyrs Brigade intervened to kill Yunus and give dominance in the military sphere to Hifter, a notorious CIA asset. So to sum it up in the simplest terms, film comes from Romney campaign by a Bolton, by a Bolton. The story on the ground in Libya is CIA asset Kumu kills U.S. ambassador, while 12-man CIA team and security forces from the February 17th Martyrs Brigade stand by. Isn't there any Democrat out there? Nobody who supports Obama wants to, uh, to go with the obvious facts in the case? Well, in the meantime, we've got uh, General Petraeus. Uh, he's uh, trying to use this for empire building. He's... Uh, He's working this issue on uh, on all sides, right?